The gallbladder is a little sac that sits under the liver. Its purpose is to store bile, and when we eat, it contracts and pushes bile through the bile duct into the intestine to help dissolve fatty foods. One of the most common reasons for a gallbladder to start causing problems is when someone develops gallstones. These are typically made up of cholesterol and are small stones in the gallbladder. The problem that happens is when you eat and the gallbladder contracts, the stone can get stuck in the duct and doesn't allow the gallbladder to empty. And that creates pain as that gallbladder becomes distended. If that persists, it can become quite inflamed. The other thing that can happen with these gallstones is they can actually be small enough to slip into the duct and they can come down and block the opening of the main bile duct which can cause people to turn yellow or jaundiced and it can also cause inflammation of the pancreas or pancreatitis. So those are all abnormalities that can be caused by gallstones. Now the typical symptoms are pain, gas, bloating caused by these gallstones. Some patients don't have gallstones, but their gallbladder acts as if there were stones in them. In other words, uh, it causes pain when it tries to contract. A HIDA scan is a test that we uh, do to try to determine if that's going on. And if the HIDA scan is positive, in other words, if the gallbladder is not working very well and or it's causing those symptoms when it's stimulated to contract, then the data shows that taking out the gallbladder will be beneficial. Now, if there are no stones, but the HIDA scan is positive, it's, it's helpful about 85% of the time. So that leaves a small percentage of patients uh, in which removing the gallbladder doesn't help the symptoms, and then it can be caused by a variety of other things uh, in this area, the liver, the pancreas, the stomach, the small intestine, and often a gastroenterologist is employed to help figure out what else is going on. Um, as mentioned previously, if the stone get or the bile duct gets blocked, it can cause jaundice. Cholangitis just means when there's an infection in the bile duct. Uh, gallbladders can sometimes uh, perforate, which means uh, get a hole in them. Um, that's a pretty uncommon thing, and people are using pretty severe pain um, if that uh, were to happen. A fistula is a communication between the gallbladder and the intestine. happens right here in this area. It's another rare complication that can happen, but be, would be a reason for removing the gallbladder. Pancreatitis. Anytime somebody gets pancreatitis because of gallstones, uh, we recommend that the gallbladder be removed so they don't get pancreatitis again in the future. There's a pretty high chance of that happening. And then... Uh, Rarely, gallbladders can have cancer in them as well and thus require removal. So the procedure is typically done laparoscopically. That means we make four small incisions, use a camera and some instruments to come in and see the anatomy. We typically place some clips across the duct here from the gallbladder and then remove the gallbladder from the liver. Um, Risks of the operation are general risks. That means uh, risks that happen in any operation. So blood clots uh, in the legs or that can go to the lungs, pneumonia from not to taking deep enough breaths, heart attack, stroke, bleeding, infection. Specific to this operation, uh, in our group there's about a 1% chance that we won't be able to do the operation laparoscopically but we would have to do it as an open operation or a large incision. That can happen because this area is really inflamed, the anatomy is abnormal, uh, the stones are stuck in the duct, um, some bleeding issues. There. So there's a, a few reasons why that could happen, but as mentioned, it only happens about 1% of the time in our group compared to about 5 to 10% nationally. There's a risk of bile leaking. Bile can leak from the liver or the bile duct. Um, often, if it's going to happen, it'll be from the liver, and it usually happens about three to five days after surgery. Uh, someone would develop severe abdominal pain. We would get the testing to figure out what was going on and find that there would be some uh, bile leaking from the liver. There's a couple of different ways of taking care of that. Uh, repeat surgery or 
an endoscopic procedure where they come down and put a stent in this bile duct to allow the bile to flow into the intestine and not out of the liver. A retained common bile duct stone, that means a stone that is down here in the duct. We routinely, during the operation, put dye into the bile duct and take an x-ray. That helps us identify the anatomy. It also helps us determine if there are stones in the bile duct. If there are, most of the time that means uh, you will be admitted to the hospital and on the following day the gastroenterologist will come in with a scope down through the stomach to this point right here, open up that opening to the bile duct and fish the stone out of there. That's called an ERCP. Um, there's a risk of injury to the duct, uh, less than 1%. Um, there's a risk of injury to the other structures that are in this area. Um, when we're using a scope, we can't see things as well as if there's a big open incision, but most of the time it's, it's more than enough for what we need to do. And then anytime you have an incision on the abdomen, there's a risk of developing a hernia where that incision is. With laparoscopic operations, that's pretty small, uh, but it does happen. All in all, these risks are a very small, three to five percent uh, for all of them combined. Um, as mentioned, most, most of these are done laparoscopically. Uh, patients usually go home the same day. And then we recommend light activity for two to three weeks until fully recovered. If we had to do the open operation, you would typically spend some time in the hospital and your activity would be restricted much less. So what are alternatives to surgery? Well, one is what we call medical management, and that is primarily watching your diet, what you're eating, avoiding foods that are triggering symptoms, because that's usually fatty, greasy foods and then using pain medicine as needed to get through those episodes. Uh, typically, once the episodes have started, they're going to continue. They're going to become more frequent and more severe. And so it's usually um, going to result in surgery at some point. The only downside to not having a gallbladder is some people will get diarrhea with fatty, greasy foods impossible ahead of time to predict who that's going to affect. For most people, it doesn't affect them. They can go back to eating and, and do just fine. For those that it does affect, it's usually just a nuisance, meaning if they're going to go have a big greasy meal, uh, they better be near a restroom because that may run right through them. About 1% of the time, we'll get patients who it doesn't matter what they eat, it all seems to run right through them, and then we end up using medications uh, to help control that. So that is uh, gallbladder disease and uh, cholecystectomy, which is the technical term for removing the gallbladder. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please be sure to ask your surgeon.